Thank you, Grace, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. Some of you listened to me this morning. Who listened to me this morning? And you came back this afternoon. You need to uh, look at your life <laughs> and uh, figure out that there are better things to do than listening to some old guy talk twice in one day. So, um, you know, Grace didn't say the reason that she really liked me is I hired her for her first academic job. So, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> well, today, as Grace said, I'd like to spend some time telling you some stories about some of the great conservationists of the past <coughs> in our world. And um, there's one thing you need to know about me in advance, and that is that I'm an optimist. Right? You can tell I'm an optimist because I have been a Chicago Cubs fan for 70 years. <laughs> and it proves that optimism is the right strategy. Because you could argue that the Cubs were a losing team, and a losing team they would always be. But no, in 2016 they won the World Series, world champions. And if you adopt an optimistic view of life, you will be a world champion as well. Yes. Hmm, yes. Maybe I should just stop there. Right? <laughs> but I, I strongly believe that the world is a better place today than it was yesterday, and it will be a better place tomorrow than it is today. And when we start talking about the environment, uh, there's ample evidence everywhere you look for that fact. Um, this is the skyline of Seattle. Forgive me, I couldn't find any historical pictures of the skyline of Bellingham that had smokestacks pouring out. This is the skyline of Seattle about 100 years ago. And this is the skyline of Seattle today. Uh, it, of course, taken on a day of, uh, where the atmosphere looks as good as it could possibly look, right? To show the contrast, a hundred years ago, cities in the United States and the world were in terrible shape. The air was full of smog and smoke and grit. The water was polluted. The streets were filled with unspeakable stuff. Today, it's so much better. And I like this slide of, uh, of Seattle because there's Mount Rainier. Right there, and you know, I spent six weeks at Fort Lewis, uh, eight, eight weeks at Fort Lewis, Washington, in basic training in 1970, and I never saw that mountain once. It was always covered in shrouds of smoke and and, and mist and things. Of course, the drill instructors didn't let us look up anyhow, so it didn't matter. Well, that's just a graphic example for, for out here, but there are many things that point to the fact that the world is getting better. The giant panda in China was recently downgraded or upgraded, I don't know what's the way to say it, from being endangered to being vulnerable by IUCN. It's doing better because the Chinese government is paying attention to its habitat and other requirements. We, are, we continue to put land into protected areas around the world. And this ha continues to happen right to this day, more so recently for marine areas than for terrestrial areas. But we are seeing the importance of protecting the Earth, and we're doing something about it. We're also feeding more people today than we ever have. Over six billion people go to bed, not with empty bellies, but with satisfied bellies, because of our ability to produce food and take care of the massive population of the world. 20 years ago, we were feeding 4 billion people. Today, we're feeding more than 6 billion. Most importantly, perhaps, is the fact that we are teaching people today to pay attention to sustainability, to pay attention to the condition of their environment. And we're teaching our children, we're teaching our grandchildren. Um, and that means that this progress that we've made will continue into the future. <coughs> Now we often say that we get to some place by standing on the shoulders of the giants who came before us. And when I was thinking about how can we portray this sense of optimism that I feel about the world getting better, I thought it would be a great way to write about the lives of some of the people that started conservation, that started the environmental movement, that started and named sustainability. And so I wrote the book that Grace held up, um, Nature's Allies. And in Nature's Allies, I profiled the lives of eight people. From the top left, John Muir, 
Rachel Carson, Aldo Leopold, Wangari Mathai, Ding Darling, Billy Frank Jr., Gru Harlem Brundtland, and Chico Mendez. Now, as I, I did these, these biographies, I thought about what do these people have in common? Are they all, were they all wealthy? Were they all um, educated? Were they all people that lived out in the woods all by themselves and didn't like people? And really, they don't have anything in common like that. But I discovered, deduced, I guess, that there are three things that these folks had in common that I think characterize what we have to do in order to make a more perfect world. First, passion. They all burned with a passion to make the world a better place by spending their time and their energy on the environment, our environment. The second thing, you know, <clears throat> lots of people burn with a white heat, white fire of passion, but that fire can burn out quickly. But these people didn't let that happen because they were persistent. They spent their entire lives working and working and working towards the goal of making the world a better place. They didn't burn out. They didn't stop. And the third thing was that they used partnerships in most cases to help replicate their work and spread it as rapidly as possible and as far as possible. You know, you can do a lot yourself, but you can do so much more when you enlist the help of others in your community of place or in your community of interest. Now, <clears throat> today, I, I wish I could uh, talk about all eight of these people, but that's why you're going to buy the book at the end of the talk. <laughs> right? uh, but I am going to briefly talk about four. First, I'll talk about Rachel Carson, then Chico Mendez, then Billy Frank Jr., and then Wangari Mathai. Okay? That good? So now you know there's four of them coming. So you can kind of keep track of where I'm going, right? So the first one is a name that's familiar to you, Rachel Carson. And actually, two things that are familiar to Rachel Carson and the book that she wrote that started basically the environmental movement. And that book was Silent Spring. Now here's my copy of Silent Spring. You can tell it's a beloved book, and you can tell it's old. Right? You can tell it's old because it costs 75 cents. <laughs> now that's back when a dollar was worth a, a dollar. <laughs> now Rachel Carson was an interesting uh, person. She was born in 1909, and she always loved two things. She loved nature, and she loved writing. And she couldn't decide which one that she would do for her career, so she chose to do both. Now she went to college. Uh, in Pennsylvania when she graduated with a degree in biology, which was a degree people didn't, uh, women didn't get back then. They got degrees, you know what they got degrees in. They got degrees in getting a husband, right? And she said, nuts with that. I want to be a scientist. I want to be a biologist. She did that and then she went to Johns Hopkins and got a master's degree in marine biology. And that allowed her to become the first professional scientist female hired by what is now the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She was the first woman to be hired in a professional capacity for that agency. And she worked there for quite some time. At the same time, she kept writing. And eventually, she wrote three books about the sea that really defined who she was. She liked to write books that were beautiful prose that also told a scientific story. And the first book she wrote in 1941 was this one, Under the Sea Wind. It was regarded by critics as being absolutely wonderful, and it was a total flop in terms of sales. Right? Gives hope for all of us who, who try to sell books. Right? Nobody bought it. Now, she had some bad timing. She published that book in November of 1941. December 7th, 1941, as you well-educated young people all know, was the day that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. And all of a sudden, the world didn't want to hear about pretty stories of the ocean. They were concerned about saving our country. So she kept working. And 10 years later, she published this book, The Sea Around Us. Sea Around Us, 1951, was a tremendous success. It was on the top of the New York Times uh, nonfiction bestseller list for months. 
People loved it. And it was so successful that she was able to quit her job working for the government and become a writer full time. And when she quit her government job, she said, this is, <laughs> this is the greatest day of my life. Now, some of you may have worked or, you know, for the government and you know what that might feel like. Right? It's a joyous time. Now, our third book was this one, uh, The Edge of the Sea. And that's the book that got me. I read that book as a young man, decided I wanted to be Rachel Carson and uh, became a fishery biologist like her. Well, life was good. It's 1955. Life is good in the United States. It's good for Rachel Carson. We were taking the wartime technologies that had been developed and turning them to peacetime uses. And they were developing plastics that could be used uh, regularly. We were developing cars that could, everybody could have a car. Everyone could have a, a television set. Uh, you know, it was a good time. And we, we found all these chemicals that had been developed and were continuing to be developed. We said, this is great. We can use these chemicals to do all sorts of good things for us. Like DDT, for example. This is an advertisement from a 1950s magazine. It says, woohoo, DDT is good for me and good for you. Good for our fruit, good for our pets, good for everybody. Now, you may not like DDT, but it is one heck of an insecticide. Right? It kills all the bugs. It lasts out there for a long time. It's cheap to make. It's easy to apply. It sticks to everything. It's great. Helped us win World War II. <coughs> helped us win World War II. And it's an example of a miracle chemical, we all thought. And, you know, we spray it when we wanted to get rid of insects, right? get rid of the mosquito larvae that might be in the swimming pool. Mm, don't worry, no need to move the kids. Just uh, spray right over the top of them, that'll be fine. It happened to me when I was a boy, <coughs> which may explain some things. Right? <laughs> but that was the attitude is that there, there were no problems, and we should, we should accept all this stuff. Well, maybe, maybe not. Because friends of Rachel Carson and other people started to discover that not only did these chemicals kill bugs, but they killed fish, and they kept, killed birds. They killed people's pets, and in some cases they killed people. And friends of Rachel Carson wrote to her and said, you have to do something about this. You have to write a book about this. And she said, no way. I am not touching this. I like to write pretty books about nature. Besides, she said, well, she didn't say, but she was shy. And she was a very private person. There were things in her extended family that today we wouldn't think anything of, but in the 1950s it was, it was, uh, uh, scandal. She didn't want any publicity. She didn't want to raise any trouble. She didn't want to do anything. But finally, she was convinced that she should work on this problem. And so she sat down and spent about five years researching Silent Spring. And to do that, she had to bring together thousands of reports from around the world. Reports from medical doctors, reports from toxicologists, reports from wildlife biologists and others. You know, there was no internet, there was no Google. In order for her to do this, it was a massive research effort to bring all this together. But she persisted. She spent years doing it, and eventually produced the book, Silent Spring, in which she presented her conclusion. And her conclusion was that we are poisoning the earth by the widespread aerial spraying of these environmental poisons. And that book also reached the top of the bestseller list, stayed there for months, and gathered the, the attention of the American people. Now, not everybody, in fact, um, as you might expect, the chemical industry didn't like these conclusions. The agricultural industry that was spraying this on food crops didn't like these ideas. The US government that was supporting the agricultural industry didn't like these ideas. And they went after Rachel Carson with a hammer and tongs. They went after her like crazy. They said, she's a woman. Why should we listen to a woman? They said, she only has a master's degree, so she's not really a scientist. She doesn't have a PhD. Well, could she know anything? They said, ah, she's a communist. 
She's a commie, pinko, nuclear bomb-hating peacenik. But then they said the really thing that got to her and got to everybody, she was single. She was a spinster. She never got married. She never had any children. So what right did she have to talk to us about the future? Because she had no investment in it. But she persisted. She, you know, I told you she was shy, right? She didn't like television. She hated television. She didn't. But finally she was convinced to be on a TV show called uh, CBS Reports. It was like that generation's version of 60 Minutes. And she was convinced that she could be interviewed for this show in the spring of 1963, right after the book was published in the fall of 1962. And she agreed to be on the show. She was nervous. She thought they would make fools of her. They, they would, they would, they would, every, all, everything would be stacked against her. It would be terrible. And it was set up to do that. So a representative of the chemical industry was this guy, uh, a guy named uh, Stevens White, Dr. Stevens White. He was British. You know, it had a British accent, right? Everybody's more intelligent if they sound British. Right? And he said, I won't do a British accent because I can't. But what he said was, if we follow the teachings of Miss Carson, we will return to the dark ages and pestilence and insects and disease will take over our farm crops and there will be massive famine. Now he looked like and sounded like an escapee from a mad scientist movie. <laughs> right? And the government guy who was there didn't, wasn't much better either. And then it was Rachel Carson Stern, and she came on the TV show, and she said she was calm, she was poised, she was professional, she was scientific, she was logical, she was reasoned, and she won the day. The next day, newspapers came out and said, Rachel Carson won. The chemical industry lost. And you know the rest of the story, which is that because of that, we have controls on these chemicals. We have an agency called the Environmental Protection Agency. We have raptors coming back because we've gotten away from these eggshell thinning chemicals. And the world is much better because of it. Now Rachel Carson didn't get to live to appreciate all that was happening because she died 18 months after the publication of the book. She died from misdiagnosed breast cancer that this whole time was consuming her body and taking her energy. There were times when she couldn't write or work for weeks at a time because she was too weak from this and related things. There was a time, that was a time when doctors didn't talk to female patients about their issues. She didn't have a husband, so no one told her that she was dying of breast cancer. She persisted, she had passion, and she worked with partners across the world to bring this story to us. And the world's a much better place today. Number two, Chico Mendez. Now, Chico Mendez is an entirely different guy. He lived in the farthest reaches of the Brazilian Amazon as a rubber tapper. Like his father and his grandfather before him, his job was to go out in the woods in the morning, run a circuit through the woods, and uh, make a slash in a rubber tree, hang a little bucket on it, go to the next one, about a three mile circuit in the woods. Come back, have some lunch, go out in the afternoon and empty the buckets into a large bucket, bring them back, have some dinner, and cook this over an open fire to make a big ball of latex that could be sent to the wholesalers. He was illiterate and enumerate. <laughs> That's a new, new word I learned that means you couldn't do math. Yeah. Describes me too, but uh. he said, "Well, other children might be learning their ABCs. I was out learning how to coax milky white sap from the bark of a rubber tree." One day, when Chico Mendez was about twelve, a man walked into their little village, and he was different than everybody else. He spoke differently, he dressed differently, he, 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 he acted differently. And this man took an interest in Chico Mendez. He saw something in him that uh, he didn't see in others. And Chico Mendez took to him too. 
Now it turns out later, we find out that this man was uh, named Euclides Tavoris, and he was a fugitive from the government because he had been on the losing side of two revolutions in Brazil, and so he was hiding out in the government, in the woods, pretending to be a rubber tapper. Well, he took Chico Mendes under his wing and taught him how to read, how to do arithmetic, um, and they did this by reading newspapers and listening to the radio, and, and so he also got lessons in social justice. And he began to develop as a person who cared about others and cared about the bigger context of the world. Now, it's, uh, Chico Mendes was born in 1944, so here it is about the start of the 1960s. And the Brazilian government decided that the best use of the Amazon rainforest was not to grow trees, but to grow cattle. And so they started a process of giving away this public land to rich landowners from east part of Brazil and having them cut down the trees and turn it into pasture land. And you, you, you know, you've seen pictures like this where here's a, a road that the government built and they gave away the land here so it gets settled and, and deforested and then there's spur roads that go off and it develops uh, more. And that's the way the Brazil was going. Chico Mendes realized that that was the death knell for his way of life and, that, and the way of life of, of the uh, indigenous people in Brazil because they lived with a sustainable lifestyle of small scale farming and uh, getting renewable crops of latex and Brazil nuts from the trees of the forest. With the forest gone, that would be gone as well. So, he became a labor union leader. He formed labor unions for rural workers and used those in conjunction with the Catholic Church that was present there and with other social organizations to build schools, to build medical facilities, to bring literacy to the people of Brazil. And his concern for the rainforest continued to grow. About this time now, it's the 1970s, and people in the United States are starting to worry about the Amazon rainforest and realize that they need a charismatic spokesperson from there in order to bring that message back up to the United States and to Europe. And this fella, uh, Stephen Schwartz, working for the Environmental Defense Fund, found Chico Mendez in the woods. Realized he had somebody who's like, they, they said he was like Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone. It was, a, it was a person who could energize people towards this mission. And he brought Chico Mendez up to the United States to talk to Congress, to talk to the World Bank, and to talk to others, and to receive a couple of environmental awards. And I love this slide. This is Chico he was Chico Mendez was a poor man, never had anything. Never had any clothes, really. And he was coming to the United States, so he had to have some clothes. So he went to the local Catholic charity shop, and they rooted around in their bins of do donated clothes, and they found this suit for him that sort of fit. You can see it's just kind of hanging on him, right? That's what he wore to meet the U.S. Congress and to meet the leaders of the World Bank and others and to receive these awards. Because Chico Mendez never did anything for himself. It was always for the passion he felt for the forests and the people that work there. And I love this quote of Chico Mendez where he says, at first I thought I was fighting to save rubber trees, then I thought I was fighting to save the Amazon rainforest, now I realize I'm fighting to save humanity. And he kept at it and he kept at it. Now he was always nonviolent, never carried a weapon, never condoned any violence. In fact he earned the nickname the Gandhi of the forest for his peaceful approaches to um, uh, um, protest in the forest. And he continued this work, working out of his small home in Acre, in Yacapuri, in the state of Acre in far western Brazil. And that little house of his had some electricity, but it had no running water, no windows, no nothing. Okay. One evening, he said to his wife, start dinner, 
I'm going to go take a shower. He threw a towel over his shoulder, walked out on the back step, and two shotgun blasts rang out from the shrubs and killed him on his doorstep. A martyr for the attempts to save the Amazon rainforest. Now the rich criminals who did this thought that they would extinguish the passion of Chico Mendez by doing this, but they didn't. This was at Christmas. He, he, was, he was killed a couple days before Christmas in 1988, on his four, just after his 44th birthday. They had his funeral on Christmas Day, and 4,000 people came to his funeral. And since then, tens of thousands have come to this small hut in the mountains, which is now a memorial to his work. And the idea didn't die with Chico Mendez. And because of his work and his attention to saving the forest for the benefit of the sustainable use of the forest, today we know that the forest is getting better in the Amazon instead of getting worse. The Brazilian uh, policies to deforest the Amazon have changed to becoming reforestation because of the work and the life of Chico Mendes. Well, the third name is the name Billy Frank Jr., which when I give this talk in the eastern United States, no one has ever heard of. I suspect most of you around here are familiar with that name, Billy Frank Jr. You may know why, but I can tell you a take on that perspective that I think is the most important thing about Billy Frank Jr. in his life. Now, Billy Frank Jr. was, uh, well, the story for Bill Billy Frank Jr. was a commercial salmon fisherman of the Nisqually people. And the Nisqually is one of several, about 20 groups that were living in this area 150 years ago when colonists from the eastern United States were just starting to come. And the US government said to the colonists, before you can settle land, in this area, we have to have treaties with the native peoples that um, I'll make it legal for this land to be available. And so the newly appointed governor of the time, a guy named uh, uh, Isaac Stevens, came out with the goal of making treaties with the Native Americans. And the first treaty he wrote was for the Mis Nisqually people on Christmas Day of 1854. Under this tree, called the Medicine Creek Treaty Tree, and you may know the location. It's right off I-5 just before you get to Olympia. In fact, I, was I spent Saturday there in sort of a semi-meditation, uh, mm, you know, trying to get into Billy Frank Jr.'s life. Well, that was a treaty just like most treaties. Um, the uh, Native Americans gave up most of their land and most of their rights. But this treaty and the others in the area kept one right for Native Americans. And this is it the right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed grounds and stations is further secured to said Indians. That is, the Indians could, sir, could fish wherever they always had fished, using whatever techniques they wished, catching as many fish as they wished for as long as they wished. Not necessarily just on their reserve lands, but anywhere that they had fished. So this was a pretty good thing to keep and for a hundred years, it didn't matter. And the Native Americans fished in their traditional ways at first, using the examples like these weir that they would put across the stream during the upstream migrations, um, and later with more modern gear like this uh, um, motorboat with a monofilament gill net. And this is Billy Frank Jr. Billy Frank Jr. was a commercial fisherman, fished on the river, all the time. Um, that's how he and his family made their living. But after World War II, the salmon started getting into trouble. Well, we gave trouble to the salmon. We built dams that stopped their, kept them from their spawning grounds. We logged right up to the stream bank and created sedimentation and hotter water. We put pollutants in the water and we were fishing at a much too high a rate. And so the salmon population started to go down. Somebody had to be blamed. 
The Native Americans at the time were taking 5% of all the fish catch. Guess who got blamed? The Native peoples, the Native Americans, the Indians got blamed for causing the, the downfall of the salmon populations. And at that point, the state of Washington, Fish and Wildlife, started arresting people doing their fishing. Billy Frank Jr. got arrested more than 50 times for just going out and fishing like the treaty rights told him. He later said, hey, I was the getting arrested guy. That's what I did. And in fact, if he was late coming home for supper, his wife would take something that they could pawn, give it to one of their kids, say, take it down to the pawn shop, get some money, and bail your dad out of jail. Because the only reason he would be late for dinner was because he got arrested for fishing. Now, as this went along, it got more and more heated. And, uh, well, there, here's a picture of Billy Frank with some of his friends that were the movers and shakers in this, this idea that uh, Native American fishing rights needed to be uh, granted, needed to be exercised, and they needed to get arrested. So these guys got arrested all the time. Things started to get nastier and nastier in the 1960s, in the late 1960s. And although you can't see this slide very well, these are um, Washington State uh, fishing and game officials, and they're dragging a net out of the water that Maisel Bridges, a Native American fisherwoman, is clinging to because she said, this is my net, and I'm fishing just the way I was said I could. And they're dragging her out onto, the, out onto the land to arrest her. One day, September 1970, things got out of hand. There was a big protest down by Olympia. Uh, shots were fired. This bridge was burned. More than 60 people were arrested. A lot of people injured. And the US attorney for Western Washington viewed this, his name was Stan Pilkin, he viewed this and he said, enough, enough, this has to stop. So the next day, he sued the state of Washington for the abrogation of treaty rights by the state of Washington's conservation folks. 1970, that trial was given to this man, Hugo Bolt. And after four years of testimony, in which Billy Frank Jr. went from the being arrested guy to the being interviewed in court guy, always there, always part of the proceedings. Judge Bolt released his, his judgment. And he said three things. The first two of them are right here. One, Indian rights have been violated. And the second one stunned everyone. People expected that he was going to give the Indians what they were catching, 5% of the catch. He said, nope. Two nations, two people, the Indians get 50%, the, the, the rest of us get 50%. They got 50% of the catch. <laughs> the rest of us didn't like that. And here's a photograph of Judge Bolt being burned in effigy on the lawn out in front of the federal courthouse in Olympia. It took four years of, of more work in the federal government to the Supreme Court finally said, Judge, Judge Bolt is right, it's the law of the land. Now that's what we all know and think about this, but the third thing that Judge Bolt said was really the difference maker. And it's this, that from now on, the Native Americans and the state and federal government co-manage the salmon resources. The decisions aren't about uh, catch and seasons and all that, they're not made by the state of Washington by itself or the federal government. They're also made collaboratively with the Native Americans. That ushered in a new necessity in management for transparency. Because if they were going to agree on what to do, everyone had to share the same information. So there was a need for data. And there were ne needs for estimation of how many fish were going to be available. And there were needs then for population models about how that could work. And that judgment by Judge Bolt and the work that Billy Frank Jr. did caused the creation of modern fisheries management. Research was developed out in the Pacific Northwest about how populations work, how they grew, how they could be exploited. 
in a sustainable way. And it spread throughout the world. And it was because of the passion and the persistence of a guy like Billy Frank Jr. to make that happen. And through all this, Billy Frank Jr. moved from being the getting arrested guy to the being testifying guy to now being the international ambassador of salmon. And he became a leader of the Native American uh, um, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. He became a friend and a confidant of five U.S. presidents to talk about what should happen. He worked with the government. He worked with uh, the timber industry. He worked with Canada. He worked with uh, uh, Japan to try to get rational Pacific uh, salmon management uh, established in the United States, in Canada, and uh, across the North Pacific. Billy Frank Jr. gets a lot of credit for this, but it was also other people that were working with him. But a tremendous, a tremendous life that he lived going after these resources. And he went from being the guy on the riverbank getting arrested to the guy who was in the boardroom making sure that we were paying attention to salmon. And because that, salmon populations are coming back. There's salmon for Native American fishermen. There's sa salmon for uh, commercial and recreational fishermen. And there are even some left over for the extraordinary brown bears of Katmai National Park. Well, let's go halfway around the world for our fourth individual. And this is, we're going to the country of Kenya here to talk about Wangari Mathai. And Wangari Mathai is a woman who did something absolutely extraordinary. You will have difficulty believing it when I tell you in a couple of minutes. Wangari Mathai, born in 1939, was a girl of the soil, as she said, the, a girl of the land. She lived in a, in a rural community in Kenya, a, a subsistence um, a farming family. And where she lived, she said, the soil was good, there was clean water, the air was clear, there was plentiful food, plentiful fruit from the trees, plentiful wood. They were happy, they were well fed, they lived well. Now Wangari Mathai was a lucky girl in a way, because one day when her mother was shipping off her brothers to go to school, one of her brothers said, hey mom, I don't know if he said that, <laughs> said hey mom, how come we go to school, but Wangari doesn't? Well, girls didn't go to school in Africa in those days. But their mother didn't have a good answer for her sons, and so she said, Wangari, put your shoes on, you're going to school. And she went to school, and she was a star. In elementary school, in middle school, in high school, and eventually in the United States, where she was, could come on a special program for that was taking uh, young Africans to the United States for a college education. And she went out to Kansas, to St. Scholastica College for Girls, and studied biology. And here you can see her doing a dissection with some friends and in her dorm room. When she finished that, she went to the University of Pittsburgh, got a master's degree, and then went back to Kenya. And she went back to Kenya as an assistant professor of veterinary medicine at the University of Nairobi's uh, veterinary school. One of her tasks was to go out into the countryside and survey the cattle populations to see what their diseases were in condition. And when she got out there, she was appalled by what she saw because the subsistence farms had turned into plantations of tea or exotic of, uh, trees. And the plantation owners now were employing what were formerly subsistence farmers as workers. So they were getting paid money, and they had to take the money to the store and buy food. Guess what? They didn't make enough money to buy enough food. So they were hungry and they were starving. The water that was so plentiful had dried up because of the change in the use of the landscape. And so women had to walk hours every day to get enough water for their families. The forests that were there and yielded fruits and wood to use the burn, uh, to uh, heat their homes and cook their food were gone so women had to walk hours to collect some 
some twigs and branches so that they could cook their food and keep their house warm. And Wangari Mathai said, I have to do something about this. This is wrong. I need to change it. And the story gets kind of complicated, but she decided that a good thing to do would be to plant trees. That if the Kenyans could plant trees back where they had been, native trees, that they could quickly reestablish their, the quality of their environment. And so she started working with small groups, <laughs> no, yeah, small groups of rural women. Sometimes I say groups of small rural w women, but <laughs> it's not that they were short. Um, with, uh, it, she would go to villages and talk to them about how to grow plants, how to grow trees. And she said, She's famous for saying, and this hurts me all the time, of course, she said, you don't need a degree to plant a tree. Now, I spent 40 years teaching people how to plant trees, so it bothers me, you know. <laughs> but she was correct. And she worked with these groups, first one, first another, then another, all the way through Kenya, developing an idea that's called, well, I'll get to that in a minute. And along the way, when she saw injustice being done, she protested, and she tried to stop it. And here, for example, she's shown um, uh, protesting at the gates of a forest, of what had been a forest, given illegal to rich friends of the president, and they were putting up a fence to keep people out, because they were cutting the trees down on the inside. And you can see the men up at the top here with their bows and arrows ready to shoot Wangari Mathai. And she was often arrested, she was often beaten, she was often injured in her passion and her persistence to go after this idea of recovering the trees of Kenya. At first she was a nuisance, then she was a problem, eventually she was made, declared an enemy of the country, an enemy of the state. She was on a list to be assassinated, she spent months living underground uh, moving from house to house, not literally underground with those small women, no, uh, moving from house to house uh, so that she wouldn't get arrested or assassinated. But she kept at it. She could not make herself stop. Here she is being taken out of jail one time when she was jailed for about two weeks and put in a damp uh, cell where she was, uh, uh, her arthritis got so bad she couldn't walk. Once she was beaten over the head, bleeding from the head. She went in to sign her arrest warrant and she just reached up and touched her head and signed her arrest warrant in blood. This is a tough woman, a tough person. But she persisted in working with these folks to plant trees. First some trees, then other trees, and it became known as the Green Belt Movement. And I just took this sign two months ago in a, a park in, in uh, Nairobi where the sign was erected to remember the work that Wangari Mathai did. And so she planted trees. How many? 50 million trees. She and her small groups of partners planted 50 million trees in the country of Kenya and tens of thousands in other countries around Kenya, tens of millions that were never counted because it wasn't her system. Oh, and along the way, she won a small award, the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize. The first time that the Nobel Committee said, recognized that in order to have a peaceful world, we have to have a sustainable world. Without a quality environment, we can't have quality lives, and without quality lives, we're not going to have peace. And they made Wangari Mathai, the first African woman to receive the prize not for avoiding armed conflict, the first environmentalist, we might argue, to ever win the Nobel Peace Prize. And it was great, because on her way to win the prize, uh, she heard about it when she was driving in a car, on her way to a hotel for an event. And when she got there, all the people in the hotel had heard about this, right? And they were out in front of the hotel and they were yelling and cheering and clapping when she got out of the car. And they said, Wangari, what can we do to help you celebrate this momentous achievement? And she said, bring me a shovel, let's plant a tree. Well, that's it. 
And that's the story of four amazing people upon whom we, whose shoulders we stand on in our work to make the world a better place. And remember, and I wish I could talk to you about all eight of them, right? But again, you can buy a book for $20. They sell for $21. I have a discount of $20, and they'll be signed by the author um, afterwards if you would like. But remember, their passion, their persistence, and their partnerships was what allowed them to become great conservationists in the past. And wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if the next time somebody writes a book like this, they profile not eight people, but nine people. And the ninth one was you. Thank you very much for listening.